like, well, wait, a, a place where police don't go and there's no services whatsoever. You'd think it would be like, you know, pew, pew, cowboys and everybody getting killed. No, nah, no, nah, it's like pot smoking and people playing music and making art and every once in a while there's a wackadoodle person but the community takes care of that it's one factor yeah like why 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 are they so intent on like nitpicking all of these people that just want to like live very piecemeal lives with like hardly any you know like currency exchange at all really very little income you're not going to get that much tax out of them and yet you give billionaires tax breaks like the fuck like well yeah and we are you you after money or you just power plays well you can see why people want to kind of disconnect from all that you know and the rat race is another thing too that that this whole like working to live living to work kind of thing um just Disconnecting it from it is such a liberating thing. But um, yeah. I don't know that the fix to climate change would be to move out of a house and into an eight-cylinder gas guzzler. Uh, well, okay, okay. No, this, this isn't primitive technology. Um, I have a sink in my boat. Um, I mean, yeah, granted. You never, oh, want, like, you never want to say sink and boat in the same sentence. <laughs> Yet another kitchen sink microscopy. I'm Eric Rosenblatt, and uh, we'd love it if you'd like and share this video, subscribe to the channel, all the good stuff. It helps a lot. And I am Casey Roshbert, and we would love it if you would uh, just stick around, like all the way through to the end of the episode, right, right there, that time, <laughs> and uh, you know, hang, hang out for the song at the end because. Uh, we, we put in a lot of work to uh, turn out songs, and uh, you can get them on iTunes and Spotify and patreon.com slash ksmvidcast. So, what would you like to discuss today? Well, as you might be able to see, behind me is a book that I've been rereading. Um, this is a book I picked up a very long time ago, and it's kind of like made me think about things. And I feel like this is kind of like kind of connected to our past previous, our previous episode uh, about climate change. Right. Um, It's called off the grid by Nick Rosen. Um, No relation to my cousin, Nick Rosenblatt. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Kind of weird there, but uh, yeah. So in this book, this guy kind of, you know, goes across the U.S. and interviews people who live off the grid in various ways for various reasons. Um, Some are financial, some are uh, personal. There's ecological reasons. Um, It it just depends. But it's really interesting because um, he talks to people, interviews them, asks their stories, kind of telling a little bit of stories. It's, a, it's almost kind of like a, a collection of short stories book. Um, the, and, and so each little section uh, talk, is talking about a group or a, a place or a person who's decided to go off grid and um, tells their experience, I guess. Yeah, uh, the one thing I've always wondered about off grid, like I'm, I'm sure there are people that go like full on off grid, but uh, you know, even the Amish to some degree have like integrated with, you know, they'll go out and get jobs and stuff like that, you know, and 
and kind of like interact with technology and, and all that stuff that, um, you know, like historically they've kind of sworn off. And I just kind of wonder like how much can you actually exist off grid anymore? Like, well, it, to, and, to and a full extent. It is it, this, that kind of thing is addressed in the book um, because there's, there's certain difficulties um and a lot of them are actually legal um but in in the amish actually i was just reading the amish section and i haven't finished it yet but apparently there's there's kind of two divergent uh i guess uh belief systems of the amish there's one that still uh doesn't believe in utilizing any form of technology um mostly be well it, it seems from what I can gather, it, there's a lot has to do with, well, if you have electricity, then you could have a radio and you could listen to the devil's music or something like that. <laughs> um, and then, but then there's this other uh, group of Amish who drive cars and trucks and they have electricity, um, some, some amenities. Uh, and what is and, their cutoff for technology though because they use wagons and you know yeah, well you'll... that's true <laughs> that, that's why i was kind of like being very specific about it being electric like yeah. elect electrical systems uh predominantly um <laughs> i yeah because ex- you're right like even tools all tools are a form of technology um those buggies all that stuff mm-hmm. i i got a lot of respect honestly for those people like i think it, it it's kind of an interesting lifestyle um and it in in the way they do things the community becomes far more central to to their existence than than say like us in an urban or suburban world you don't even know your neighbor you know in Mm -hmm. amish communities like everybody knows everybody and maybe that's not a good thing um, but uh, it does bring people together, I guess, in a way that we've kind of lost, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, how much does it, though? I mean, because when you remove all that technology, like your entire existence is spent just like working to survive, like even more so than, you know, like with with jobs and the 40 hour work week and stuff, we've kind of truncated how much we actually have to do in order to like get by. And we've built in some time for hobbies and socialization and stuff like that. I mean, it's never enough, but you know, it's, it's more than would it would be if you were like a hundred percent off the grid and like hunter gatherer or whatever. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hunter gatherer. You're going to be, that, that's a whole different thing but like the amish there's there's a lot of communal uh systems um yes they do work a lot but the the thing is in their culture hard work is fulfilling and so nobody cares about having to work a whole bunch of hours to plow fields or repair a wagon or fix a roof or build a building or something it's like well that's part of what you do um, and, and in it, they gain some kind of fulfillment. Um, it, I don't know. I, I, it is kind of, kind of an appealing sort of thing. Um, but I, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to off-grid living. I mean, the Amish are a really large scale, obvious example, but there's individual kind of uh, examples, you know, people, in small communities. One of my favorites is a place, I think it's a disused uh, military base with a, uh, an airfield. I think it's in California. It's called Slab City. Um, and it's kind of like a very uh, anarchistic little community of like hippies and artists and weirdos. Uh, just the, they're building their own stuff. There's no code. There's no law. There's nothing. People are just living there. They, they have solar. A, a lot of trade revolves around like drugs generally um, and crafts, I suppose, and, and physical labor. Um, but it, it's an interesting thing because everybody there has their own reasons for being there. Um, and they're all different. 
And it's kind of cool that that in that it, it it's kind of a flourishing sort of place and actually kind of peaceful. You know, you would think, well, wait, a, a place where police don't go and there's no services whatsoever. You'd think it would be like, you know, pew, pew, cowboys and everybody getting killed. No, no, it's like pot smoking and people playing music and making art and every once in a while there's a wackadoodle person but the community takes care of that um but you know no building codes you, you there's all kinds of weird shacks and hand-built things that people built out of found materials and stuff and i i, I think it's awesome because i guess it, if climate change occurs how it's predicted to occur then off-grid or sustainable communities are going to be vital for future survival. Like being able to adapt and, and live with minimal resources and stuff and, and, and kind of be flexible and, uh, and that kind of thing. Like I, cause I, I would say like in certain areas, not all of them, but in certain areas, the, the way of life that, that people have come to expect would, if, those predictions are correct, would come to an end. Um, so the idea of living with less, um, you know, uh, DIY, I guess, I, I don't know. Um, that that kind of becomes a much bigger thing. And I think it should be become, be, if, you, if you're concerned about climate change, it should become a bigger thing sooner um, because that's actually a pretty good way to avoid uh, energy expenditure. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I think it's good that there are little pockets of places like that. Um, you know, it without the necessity of having to live that way, I don't know about like, making a full on transition or anything. Because there's, there's still a lot of technology that could actually help us get out of this mess. And if we were just like throwing our hands in the air and be like, well, let's just get ready for the, the uh, end of the world or whatever. Like, we'd, I don't, we'd I don't be mean like... that necessarily, <laughs> but I mean, if it, if it does happen, um, that would be the direction that would keep humanity alive, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I wouldn't say, you, you know, being off grid doesn't mean getting rid of all technology. This isn't like Thoreau, or anything like that you know you live in a little shack or what who that 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 super cool old dude that lived in alaska and a home built log cabin for years and years uh pbs had a special about that guy you don't necessarily have like you could be pretty high tech you, you know you can have all kinds of advanced medical technology and supercomputers and uh, factories and all kinds of things off the grid um, if you scale up these more intimate systems so why don't we define off the grid are we talking yeah. about like in a very literal sense like you're not drawing power from the government and you know like all that stuff or is it a little bit more philosophical like you're just not dependent on society outside of your little commune or. But I would say it's kind of both, uh, but you know, it's not just drawing power. It's using resources in general, whether it be mm -hmm. electricity, municipal water supplies, sewer, um, garbage collection, all that kind of thing. Like any kind of centralized large scale system um, being off grid means not being a part of any of those things. So essentially the idea is you generate your own power. If you need it, uh, you create your own water, um, you process your own waste and there, in wherever you are, there's no need for an external, uh, influx of resources. Uh, well, there still is in terms of materials, obviously like there's going to be things you can't make. And so trading, you know, barter, trade, whatever, um, you're going to have to get some things that you can't get. If you live in the desert, 
well, there's a limit to what you can do there. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to have to trade with people that don't live in the desert. And, and why maybe, is that shit always in the desert? Uh, oh. Because because land is cheap. That's why. <laughs> like property tax is almost non-existent in, in desert areas. Land is very cheap. Um, you know, I've seen. I, I almost clicked by it now on a few of these. Like I've seen some eBay listings in uh, deserts of Nevada. You know, twenty acres for two thousand dollars, and yeah, it's a little rustic out there, kind of, kind of remote. Um, but you know, to have a place to call home for two thousand dollars plus whatever structure you put in there, um, that's that's a big deal, and that's a lot of space too. So you don't. It's not like here in say Tacoma where plots of land are basically big enough for you know family or whatever um out there it, we had 20 acres is, that's a lot of room you could bring a whole bunch of people in and you could build your own systems build your own community basically um the only thing you have to deal with of course is resistance to being independent which is one of the biggest hurdles uh i think it's very easy to to live in really harsh conditions. I think it's pretty evident um, that humans can live in some pretty crazy, and, and they thrive in some pretty crazy places. I mean, you look at the Eskimos. What the fuck are they doing out there in the middle of the, <laughs> the Arctic tundra or something? You know, why? Who wants to live there? Well, they do, and do yeah. pretty all right. I, 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 I don't really understand the, the like... Uh, the need to like try to prevent that from being a thing because like if if you're not drawing resources and you're not bothering anybody um i don't i don't see a problem with doing what, what you're gonna do um, I, I i completely agree but you know there's a lot of people um who have a problem with that they don't want people being independent for whatever reason and and um, what is it they just want your income tax or or whatever and it's like that, that's what, one factor yeah like why 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 are they so intent on like nitpicking all of these people that just want to like live very piecemeal lives with like hardly any you know like currency exchange at all really very little income you're not going to get that much tax out of them. And yet you give billionaires tax breaks. Like what the fuck? Like, well, yeah. And we are, you, are you after money or are you just power plays? Like, uh, <laughs> I, I would say it's the latter. Yeah, exactly. That, it, it, and even if you use alternate currencies, crypto or something, you know, there's actually, that's its own kind of thing. It's kind of an interesting topic. Like the Ithaca hour, I think should be researched because it's kind of one of many of these little alternate currencies that have existed. Um, it's still in the, in the eyes of the IRS viewed as income and yeah, you're right. Like what, what's the point? Look, we're what the budget budget deficit. It's like trillions of dollars in the hole. And you know, what is it? 20 something. I, I can't, I've lost count. Like, yesterday uh 20 something trillion dollars in debt like who who cares about somebody trading you know uh an old rusty pickup for i don't know like some kind of water tank or something like that what who cares about that what what, what does that what does that matter but you know uh bureaucrats are gonna bureaucrat i guess it's always <laughs> baffled me like ever since i was a kid like who are we in debt to? <laughs> Ourselves. Well, in a sense, yeah. it's it's the Federal Reserve. Um, yeah. That that is a big old mess. <laughs> um, yeah, like yeah. we owe ourselves twenty trillion dollars. But then, <laughs> you and I, you know, we're the ones paying ourselves uh, ourselves back for stuff that we didn't decide to buy. Like, ah, blah, blah, blah. What, I need what, to uh, print some more money. <laughs> Well, you can see why people want to kind of disconnect from all that, you know, and the rat race is another thing, too, that that 
this whole like working to live, living to work kind of thing. Um, just disconnecting it from it is such a liberating thing. Um, and well, that's one of the things, one of the reasons I, I bought a boat, because that's my plan. I, my, I, there is no way I, I do not expect to get any, um, you know, retirement money whatsoever. I, I, Social Security is probably going to be gone by the time I hit retirement age. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to retire by the time I'm 50. And people are like, well, you can't do that. And I'm like, the hell I can. You know, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> Uh, and the key is like cutting costs to the point where your costs are almost negligent um or negligible yeah (laughs) more beer yay my my costs are always negligent (laughs) (laughs) that's how i got where into the mess that i got into yeah (laughs) Hmm. yeah i i mean we talked about seasteading that's that's kind of an off the grid example too isn't it yeah, it's, it's pretty similar. I mean, kind of the same thing. It's just in the water instead of on land. Yeah. Um, people are a lot more comfortable on land, though. So it, it, it's a lot easier to convince people to do that. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I think for a lot of reasons, I mean, there, for basically every personality type out there, all the people who feel strongly about something like freedom, independence, um, the environment, um, you know, financial stuff. Like there's for everybody out there being off grid, like living off grid can be a really appealing thing to do. Um, no matter who you are, um, especially, Oh, I, I would say, especially if you're a young person, you, you want to start living off grid. And that brings me into another point, boondocking. Uh, that's something that I think that a lot of younger people should be starting off with is car living or RV living or trailer living, um, you know, to, to compensate for the, the, all the bullshit inflation and, and extreme costs that they're up against. Um, you know, if you if you live in a van um, or an RV, like a small RV, you can live pretty well, and your costs are almost nothing. Just yeah. basic maintenance. Maybe you got to like pump out every once in a while, or get some fresh water or something. Um, find yeah, I've got park. quite a few friends that do this actually, and mm-hmm. and I kind of follow their their travels and, and stuff like that, and um a lot of the problems they have is like finding a place to, you know, camp out, you know, like park the RV mm-hmm. without getting hassled or robbed or carjacked or, you know, um, you know breaking down in the middle of the desert, and, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and all, all that stuff, like it, you know, everything's got its hazards. And it, it's, it's kind of like there, there's something a little bit romantic about it. Um, and it, it is sort of a, I don't know, like, especially this is something I wish I did when I was younger. Um, but I'll say for, for some of those situations, always be armed, um, be ready. Because uh, there's some crazy people out there, especially if you're boondocking, because the kinds of places you're allowed to be in or, or you can sneak into typically tend to be kind of dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I and thought about brings- getting an RV when I moved back here from Memphis, but yeah. um, it's the upfront cost is is too much. Um, well, it's a hell of a lot less than than a house. Well, like, if you if your only other option is to buy a house, yes, but if you yeah. rent, then it's way cheaper to rent. <laughs> well, but usually you don't rent an RV. You know, you can find them for like a few thousand dollars and. Mm, maybe no, you can't <laughs> yeah you can i, I mean, just saw a few on craigslist like i mean a running it, one is at, at least ten thousand. I i wouldn't say at least um and and now you've got other options there's vans that you can, can convert there's cars you, you you have to start incrementally so you start with what you have you mm-hmm. you get a car you 
sleep in that for a while, save up some cash with your zero cost residence, um, build it up. And then you, you, you go to the next step. Maybe you buy a van and, and then you live in the van for a while. And then you start improving the van. And then the van is all of a sudden like really, really cool. Cause you've turned it into kind of like a mini RV. So you sell that to somebody, to the next person that comes before you. Um, and then you buy yourself a bigger thing, a, a bigger RV. Like those are options. The, the problem I see is that with all of this, and, and this is a huge problem, is that homelessness is illegal in most parts of the U.S. And, and homelessness is kind of a bullshit term anyway, because it's like, well, what is a home? Isn't home where you sleep, like where you live? If it's like some corner uh, of a parking lot or a car, or it's a little shack that you built in the woods or some think, McMansion or something like it's that's home. I think most live. people consider it to be something that they could permanently comfortably reside in. Well, you could do that in an RV. And that, that this is the thing I want to eliminate the stigma of not having a permanent geographical location. Like, I, I think that is a huge problem. Like an, an all, RV for sure you could, yeah. because it's, it's got all, you know, like toiletries and everything like that. You, you can have a little kitchen, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's made to be exactly that a home on wheels, but yeah. you go smaller than that and you start running into hardships and stuff, you know, living, Good. living in a van, you know, like, bathing yourself cooking like it's possible but it's really difficult and you're limited and bathrooms are very rare to squeeze into a van you know well yeah composting toilets are an option i mean but but then you know it depends on where you work like where i work um there's showers available for employees there's bathrooms there's basically everything so if i could just park on the side of the road and come to work uh, well my costs living costs would be like almost nothing. Yeah. Um, it, but it's kind of that whole stigma thing where people feel like, oh, you live in a van. There must be something wrong. Like, I want that to end. I want yeah. more people to do this. Like, this is that this ties in with this whole climate change thing. Like, cutting down on our consumption um, is really, really important. Like living within your means is really important. People, th- we're bred, like we're conditioned that we have to have like a big old house and stuff. And maybe if you have a family or something, well, and that's a whole different conversation. Like maybe families ought not to be so big. Maybe one kid is okay, but but 10. Okay. I've been thinking we, need, we should talk about, you know, like the overpopulation concept sometime mm-hmm. but um yeah. i don't know that the fix to climate change would be to move out of a house and into an eight-cylinder gas guzzler uh, well, okay okay no you're, you're right but you don't necessarily have to be driving all the time if society was okay with you just parking in a disused space and i don't think the solution to climate change is like there's a one size fits all solution, you know, like the green new deal, (laughs) pathetic. Um, I, there, there's, there's better ways of doing things. Every little bit counts, like every bit you can save, um, every bit you can reuse and, and repurpose. Um, uh, like if you can live simpler and smaller with less, that will help. I mean, sure. It's not going to fix everything, obviously, um, it'd be nice if we stopped fighting wars because fuel consumption there is kind of a big deal. Um, mm. but it like, there's a lot of solutions, but the living spaces that people live in, I think is, is a significant one. And, and all of the things we have to do to support living in that space the, the thing, like all this commuting, especially around here in, in the I-5 Washington area, um, because of the 
cost of living in Seattle. People don't live in Seattle, but they work in Seattle because, you know, you got to make a whole bunch of money to pay the bills. So everybody's driving into Seattle from north and south, east and well, not west. Uh, they might Some be boating in from the west. Come on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are coming from all over. And, and same thing with Tacoma. Tacoma is kind of getting big again. And, you know, if you lived in a very limited space, right? Like say you lived in a small RV or, or something and, and that was, that was your home. Um, well, you don't have to make a lot of money to support that, that living system. So you could work locally. You, maybe you could even make do working at McDonald's and in fact, probably live like a King. Like if, if your total monthly costs living in an RV might be like a hundred dollars, imagine if you made McDonald's wages, how much cash you'd have. Like that's a <laughs> shit ton of money. And and the funny thing is, it's not much different than what somebody that works in Seattle has left over after they paid the bills in Seattle or Tacoma or Issaquah or Everett or whatever. Like especially accounting for all the commuting and, and all that stuff. Like, I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? it? It always comes down to commuting. Yeah. Like we're constantly shoving everything into as small a space as possible and saying, this is where everything has to be and everything has to happen here. And you all have to come here at the same time of the same days. Oh you know? God. Oh. <laughs> the hours. That's, that's the like, problem. The whole like, you know, nine to five kind of thing, you know, it's not really nine to five anymore, but everything starts and stops at the same time. So everybody is coming in and leaving at the same time. And they're doing stuff where those hours don't even matter. I don't mm -hmm. get it. Why not space it out a little bit? You know, okay. I get it. If, if you don't want to work in the middle of the night, but you don't have to work in the middle of the night just by offsetting uh, you know, hours by like an hour or two. Yeah. It, it, that makes a huge difference. Like doctor's offices, you know, like, yeah. Like, like you said, just start like two hours later and then two hours later, because most people are going to have to like take time off of work just to go to the doctor and then coordinate that with the doctor's schedule. And, and then the doctor will cancel on you at the last minute. And, you know, <laughs> like, you know, the services that people need to use and then have to leave work in order to use that, that makes no sense. So like doctors shouldn't be on a nine to five, you know, no. well, and, things, and things imagine, like that, you know, really should be staggered. Sure. And, and, and that that's a big problem too. You know, you spend like an hour or two commuting to work, you get to work, you work a few hours and you're like, Oh, time for my doctor's appointment. You hop in the car and you drive another hour to the doctor's appointment. Then you drive like another hour coming back to work. Then you commute two hours more all the while you're pumping out yeah. emissions and stuff like uh, it, uh, it, it, it I, I, what you said earlier about this whole centralization of, of where everybody congregates, it, that I think is a huge problem. Yeah. Why does everything have to happen in one spot? I mean, if, if I were the mayor of a city and this would be really, nobody would like this. It would get so <laughs> much pushback. I, I would, I would, I would make every business prove to me why they need to be in Seattle. You know, if I'm, if I'm the mayor of Seattle, I'm going to say, why does your car insurance office need to be in Seattle? Do you see clients on a regular basis that live in, you know, like a six block radius, like walking distance? Mm -hmm. Like, is that, is that your target? Uh, if not, get the fuck out. You yeah. Know, go well, to Black exactly. Diamond, you know, go to Black Diamond well, and set up shop, you know? Sure. And, and given the fact that a lot of like, I would, I would probably say the majority of things offered in Seattle. Well, the, the things that are not the majority are support systems for the majority, you know, restaurants and, and services and things to support the people who are working in Seattle. Yeah. Um, but the rest of them are there and they're doing stuff where the location is irrelevant. I mean, it may have been relevant 
a hundred years ago, but at, a the internet exists now. You can yeah. work anywhere. You could do it support support services can happen anywhere. So why don't we spread things out a little bit? Yeah, you and know? for the commerce that depends on other commerce, it's like, I mean, the sad reality is like businesses come and go. They live and die. It's just like natural selection, you know. Like yeah. you, not everyone can own a business because then there'd be way too much like noise, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, like some things just have to go out of business. It's the nature of business. Well, and, and you know, not everybody can own a business, but not everybody wants to. Some people mm -hmm. don't want the difficulty and the complexity. Like they just want to punch a card and come into yeah. work. Like they don't want to know all the bookkeeping, all the accounting. Go they, they don't want to deal with any of that stuff. It all is a pain. Paperwork. Yeah, <laughs> it's a huge hassle. And yeah, you might get paid a little bit less being, you know, an employee of a business, but you know, they're, there's perks to it, which is like so the lowest paying job I ever had was when we owned a business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, it was an experiment. Um, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, that what was it three times less than the federal minimum wage. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as a business, we OK, so we did survive longer than uh, the expected survival rate of the average business yeah our our business because we were able to live thrifty lives mm -hmm. you know in our personal lives um we were able to like make enough money that the business could exist you know it was like kind of a net zero sort of existence yeah <laughs> yeah but it was um, a it was something we built ourselves but we didn't I, lose I, money we didn't hemorrhage money yeah. And that, that's something I feel really good about. Like we were able to build that from, I think we, we came in with $500 a piece and started yeah. that and it ran for six years and that's kind of cool. And then and we it, sold the business for a thousand dollars. Yeah. Yes. And the only reason we <laughs> shut it down is because, well, we wanted to go different directions. You know, I, I wanted to stop paying the crazy taxes that you have to pay as a business owner. And you wanted to go into the medical uh, a medical direction, uh, cancer or biology and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't really compatible with running a printer repair business. <laughs> but it was no, I, I tried for a while, like the school and, and running the business and like, uh, it was that's, that's rough. too much juggling. Yeah. Like, you just can't do that. Um, but you know, that, that was the thing we didn't shut down because, well, there, you know, things aren't going so well because in fact they were actually going they were going all right um yeah we just shut down because well hey we want to do something different but uh, see it's smart that we did that because you know i look back now and i i be like oh, that business could never exist today you know yeah. just the the nature of of how you know printer prices have plummeted as well as as well as their their quality but you know, it's, it's crossed that threshold where it actually just is cheaper to buy a new one. Yeah, it pretty much is. So. Um, <laughs> and you know, right place at the right time, I guess. Yeah. And, and that's difficult to know, but I think that's another thing too, that kind of goes into this whole, um, uh, off grid living kind of thing is, is operating a business, like knowing what people want and being able to supply that service to the people nearby um, i can see how that might be easier in some ways if you're off the grid because it's probably easier to be more adaptable like yeah i remember we had we had tossed around ideas of different ways of making income but it would require in some cases like depending on what we we're thinking of you know like different permits or different taxes or you know like yeah. just a whole host of different crap that we you know have to do well that just the, the government always throws a monkey wrench in things i mean you remember like 95 percent of it was yeah probably yeah. strictly government but you know some stuff needed brick and mortar and we weren't always brick and mortar and you and, know. and yeah some needed capital too it's like okay mm -hmm. well this is a really good idea but it's going to require like fifty thousand yeah. dollars of investment to to even begin it and we don't even know if it's going to work. Um, so, yeah, 
it i i don't know i i'm it, my my thought is uh it requires a paradigm shift in the way people view society and their place in it. Um, you know, if, if we're going to make things uh, sustainable and, and environmentally friendly, it's going to require people to look at things differently. And that's, a, that's, that's a tough sell. Um, I don't, uh, you know, if you, it's hard when, when people's identity are, it's like, oh, you know, as a kid, you're like, oh, I want a race car and I want the white picket fence and the big family and all this stuff. And it's like, well, why do you want that? Do you want it because you want it? Or do you want it because you see other people and you're trying to emulate them? Um, and I would say it's probably more the latter. The, 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 that, that's why everybody has a pickup truck, even though most of the pickup trucks I've seen around here are like shiny. <laughs> like they've got these lifted pickups and stuff. And it's like, and they're, they're shiny and clean. And every time I see a pickup that's like rusted and beat up and full of dirt and stuff, I'm like, Hell yeah, they're actually using it for the purpose it's intended for. Um, and but that's few and far between. And you know that that applies to to everything, like what people expect in their lives. Like uh, people people feel like they're a failure if they're living out of a car, and I don't think they should be. I think you should success. The, the sense of success comes from within, not from other people's opinion. I mean, it comes from your, your own personal goals, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell people that they should pare down their goals necessarily. Like if you, if you have uh, like, I mean, I, what I want out of a living situation couldn't happen in an off the grid or a boat you know like anything like that like i want to have like a nice recording studio in my in my home and, you know like a, a pretty decent like gym would be nice you know mm -hmm. so i can keep fit you know things like that require like space and infrastructure and you know like all kinds of shit and, and like stable internet and blah 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 you know like yeah. these are these are all things that require like the the uh, whole is greater than the sum of the parts uh, sort of infrastructure that you get from having like a, a structured society that is is operated in like one way so that it operates well you know if you have yeah. everybody trying to do their own thing it's the too many cooks in the kitchen problem like nothing well, and, will ever get done and standards do evolve naturally um, so I don't think that all of those things would be a problem. Um, but certainly like, yeah, what, what you're saying, the things that you want, um, do require some things. I, I actually kind of want kind of the same things, but I've found clever ways to, uh, do the same thing with a little bit less, <laughs> um, uh, you know, like as long as you're willing to make a few sacrifices and that then maybe you can have those things with a lot less space, a lot less, maybe not less cost. Sometimes with reduced volume comes increased costs. Go figure. Yeah. Um, but for, for a lot of people, a lot of people like, Oh, Hey, they just want to play video games. They just want to watch videos, watch TV and stuff like that raise a small family and stuff, have a dog. Like, yeah, you could do that off grid very easily. Yeah. You don't need a giant structure around you. You know, you don't necessarily need a, a, a 3000 square foot house to have the things that you want, but we're told, Oh, it's, it's this whole kind of dick wagging thing. Like, Oh, <laughs> well, you know, comparing people to each other, 
you know, keeping up with the Joneses and stuff like, oh, that person has like a small house and they've got like a tarp for a roof. Oh, they must be some kind of, I don't know, some kind of homeless person. Like, you know. So what if we are slaves in a simulation and the government is this malevolent god being that (laughs) created the simulation and put us in it to like a you know give it offerings and (laughs) (laughs) well man oh yeah yeah (laughs) don't bring up the simulation theory around me right now oh i mean that but that's something to consider that like consider all why why are things the way they are why do i feel the way i do it's really important to analyze that kind of thing because the more you analyze it the more you realize how much bullshit there is um how much of it's nonsense um and it makes you more independent um uh, that's kind of my thing I guess is like as somebody who values independence and by the way, independence does not mean separate. Um, It just means not being dependent on central systems or anything like that. You can still have communities and things like that. Um, It, what was I saying? Um, (laughs) Um, well i don't remember now (laughs) uh well yeah the whole independence thing but i I think there was a bigger point behind that um i'll remember it it was it was just kind of like your one of your values Mm -hmm. i think is what you're basically getting at so yeah yeah yeah. and and yeah that no that's fine like there's plenty of people that think that way and i i fully support having you know little sovereign pockets i mean we 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 have sovereignty for native americans i think we should i think we should offer sovereignty as as a, a alternative reconciliation or whatever um mm-hmm. that's not the right word is it um well reparation I, oh, reparation yeah, okay. for yeah. for descendants of slavery and blah blah blah. you know like i i think that's actually like something that we really should be utilizing and Mm -hmm. offering because you know like something you said early on in the show is like people in those communities are there for all different reasons and i was thinking like anyone in any city is there for a reason unless they are like stuck there by by virtue of their caste system yeah you know, like which what they're born into you know like and 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 here's the thing the thing about the whole caste system and 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 that kind of thing it, it it's self-imposed um anybody with knowledge can break out of that uh, well and okay it depends on where you are um in in some places it might be more difficult than others um but it's entirely possible it just requires knowledge um yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> the skexies oh yeah mm. well uh yeah maybe we could keep this one on the shorter side and you know i think we we did cover quite a quite a lot of ground oh yeah i'm sure there's going to be uh some food for thought and yeah i i feel like i didn't even feel like i barely covered what like it's a big, my own big philosophy topic. it's really big yeah but i think at least I, I i'm hoping that like we discussed kind of like the the key points of it yeah yeah i'm sure there's plenty we missed like you know as with any episode i'll think back on it a, a day or a week later and be like oh man we could have talked for like another <laughs> half hour on you know like <laughs> yep but you know the exact same thing <laughs> but that's okay you know that that as we say keep the conversation going um, yeah. i don't think it's possible to to ever 
succinctly explain or or converse about anything i think it requires a, a large amount of time and discussion and analysis and and you know the whole sleeping on things and waking up and be like oh shit i missed that point <laughs> that's actually a good thing um well i would say thanks for deep sink diving with us but we don't have a sink in this off-grid community here it's uh, more like a deep mud puddle diving uh, <laughs> well th no th this isn't <laughs> primitive technology um i have a sink in my boat um <laughs> I mean, yeah, granted. You never like, want you never want to say sink and boat in the same. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> call it call it a basin at that point. Yes, yes. I have a stainless steel uh, hand washing basin. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, for those who have stuck it out. To the end um well stick around a bit longer because there's going to be a song coming up i think i hear it you hear that yeah Ooh, oh well, that's a good one. Oh yeah that's that's my jam yeah <laughs> well yeah well you're about to hear it without us yakking and jaw jabbering over it <laughs> To 11. Uh, sir, it doesn't go that high. But this ship goes to 11. <laughs>